Thank you very much. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, the Royal London Hospital. It's uh, simultaneously uh, the UK's oldest trauma hospital in that uh, trauma was actually written into uh, the constitution of the hospital when it was first set up uh, in 1740. And, and it's also the newest hospital as well, uh, because we have this uh, state-of-the-art facility uh, less than two years old, uh, less than 50 metres away from us. It's a hospital of firsts, and I think this is important contextual information uh, when you ask yourselves, well, do we have any corporate uh, expertise in trying to answer trauma questions? Uh, with the first UK pilot trauma centre, of course, uh, HEMS were the first air ambulance to base themselves uh, in a, uh, a major trauma centre, we had the first multidisciplinary trauma ward and another of the first, including the first chair of trauma sciences, uh, represented by Karen Brogy uh, to my left. So we are innovators with regard to trauma care, but also pretty busy. We are the busiest trauma centre in the UK, possibly Europe. Uh, we're certainly the busiest paediatric trauma centre, uh, and we reconstruct more uh, head and facial injuries uh, than any other uh, unit uh, in the United Kingdom. And we're getting busier. Uh, this is a data sample of uh, patients with trauma who require more than three days worth of inpatient care at this hospital. And you can see that in 2006, we had a total of 216, uh, 2012, 942. We're also pretty good at treating critically injured patients. This graph represents outcome in patients who suffer from severe exsanguinating, that's bleeding to death, pelvic trauma. Uh, and that's an injury pattern which is represented amongst cyclists involved in HGV collisions. Um, and over the years 2007 to 2010, through introducing a number of different measures, a packet, a bundle of treatment measures, if you like, no single strand by itself is sufficient, we managed to reduce our mortality in that group of patients from more than 50% to somewhere around 20%. Meanwhile, uh, other major trauma centres uh, were uh, still variable uh, in their outcomes, uh, represented by the white bars in that graph. And we think that this concept of a holistic approach to trauma is crucial to the care of trauma patients. It's not just about treatment, it's about prevention as well. In the treatment phase, it's not just about a single specialty it's about multiple different elements working in concert in a holistic manner, remembering that the patient is the centre of each and every endeavour they pursue. We don't just look after our local population. Our responsibility to care for patients with major trauma extends as far east as South End and as far north uh, as Barnet. That's our East London and Essex trauma network. One important strand of our uh, trauma activity um, is research. Uh, this is graph represents the number of publications uh, emanating from this versus other uh, trauma institutes uh, within the UK, uh, and we're proud to say that we are leading the pack with regards to that. Internationally, uh, we're ahead of every other European nation apart from Germany. Um, we are lagging behind a little bit in terms of publications uh, from the United States. A lot of our activities focus around education not just doctors, not just surgeons, but therapists, nurses, the whole team. It's a curbside to rehab effort to make sure that education uh, is delivered appropriately. And we have a healthy history of engaging with public health issues. Uh, we're well known for uh, being part of the dialogue surrounding interpersonal violence and knife crime. And we're only too pleased uh, to be with you here today to address the problem of cycling injury and death. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Curry. What I would like to do is give you a flavour of, of what that means to us um, on a daily basis. Now, uh, at some stage at today, we may get a call that says a team is coming with a patient, and the patient is a cyclist who's been run over by a lorry, and they'll be with us in 30 minutes. Where do you start? Well, we start by mobilising a trauma team, led by a consultant in emergency medicine, staffed by surgeons, uh, anaesthetists, orthopaedic surgeons. And it has to be consultant-led and consultant-delivered. As Nigel alluded to, the corporate experience and corporate knowledge 
of what we do on a daily basis in a busy trauma hospital means that the patient's going to get a much better response. It has to have expertise, and it's no longer the days of simply scooping a patient off the roadside and bringing them to hospital. We're going to have an augmented response by an air ambulance team that means the patient's already anaesthetised, bleeding is, uh, attempts at bleeding have already started, and the patient's then going to move smoothly into the, into the emergency department and from there to the rest of the hospital. We have a state-of-the-art facility. We have everything that we could possibly need in the emergency department. We have to assume that every single part of this patient is injured. We cannot just simply say, well, we'll just see how they are when they get here. Everything has to be ready to perform life-saving surgery, blood transfusion, resuscitate them, so that we can try and fix these patients. And literally, they are injured from head to toe. And time isn't on our side. We have to have everybody there from the get-go to fix them. This is a bleeding patient, and an operation stops bleeding. It has to be a heightened response. We have to have blood, we have to have blood products ready. And we have to think about early hemorrhage control. This may necessitate an operation in the emergency department. This may necessitate something called reboa, putting a balloon up the main artery, blowing the balloon up, and stopping blood bleeding from a broken, shattered pelvis or, or, or amputated limbs. This is pushing everything very far forward. Damage control surgery, damage control resuscitation. Much like the Navy do when a ship is, is, is damaged at sea, they want to carry on and fight or, or limp back to port to be fixed. We have to do things, we have to curtail our efforts. It's about physiology, not anatomy. We have to get this patient over that first hour of their injury so that we can bring them back later on in the same day, bring them back the next day to rehabilitate, to, to put everything back together. So this is a very, very different mindset. This is a very different injured patient to the one that may limp into their local emergency department. This is a patient where time really is not on their side and a patient that is dying and may well be dying right in front of us. So the, the response has to be maximum. And we will then bring them back and we will fix them at a later date. Definitively, we'll put bits of organs back together, bits of bowel back together. We will take temporary metal work away, replace it with more definitive repairs. So this is a very different game to someone that's, that's simply injured. This is a, a, a patient who has been run over by a lorry. Everything changes. there's a time period before any members of the ambulance service or, or pre-hospital care doctors actually get to a patient and, and those sort of five ten minutes can be the loneliest longest minutes of someone's life whether they're living or dying at the end of it if we can help the public if we can um, by use of, of, of mobile phones allow the ambulance control paramedic to really get a good sense of what is wrong with the patient and therefore send the appropriate response and the appropriate resources at the right time. And have we got those resources for more hours of the day? The air ambulance at the moment in London flies eight till five or six, shorter in the winter. Is it possible to have a second air ambulance, a greater number of teams that are able to, to look after patients for longer hours during the day within the whole of the year if I can get to them in a timely fashion? Are we able to diagnose traumatic brain injury, for instance, on scene? Can we have a CT scanner in our air ambulance, in our ambulance, uh, in our land ambulances like they do in Germany? And therefore, can we evacuate bleeds around the brain at a much earlier stage so that people would be better uh, in the long The other themes from both tables that we sat with um, were really centering around the management of the patient after that acute phase of care. And it seems that uh, there are uh, there's a gap in the coherency of delivery of rehabilitation. There are services out there, but their communication between each phase of care can be improved to ensure particularly the psychological care for uh, victims uh, of trauma, psychological trauma, uh, is delivered in a more appropriate way. So it's about exploiting resources which may be out there, but joining them up together in a more patient-centered uh, and coherent manner so that the care is seamless from curbside to 
um, but this very fertile material, which I think if people knew about, would produce change. So thank you very warmly for your participation. Thank you, Bart's charity.